it's Monday, January 8th. I'm Rim. And I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight we explain the differences between all of those computer majors. Let's do this. So not only are we back, finally, after the holidays and being tired, but I'm fully well rested. I think we're totally back in action 100%. At least for another week until we play D&D this weekend and that all goes to hell. It's only downhill from here, people. Yeah, pretty much. So enjoy this while it lasts. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so what's been happening lately? I don't know. We spent a weekend going up the road being uh, consumer whores. Uh, yeah, that we did. I got a new phone, which I didn't talk about because I was waiting for an actual Monday show and we missed two Monday shows. Yep, and we got a bunch of uh, board games. Yeah. Not going to say much about the phone because I ended up not getting a fancy smartphone or whatever because uh, phones in the U.S. suck ass. All I can say is if you're in an area in which Verizon is the only uh, provider that offers service, as I am, uh, and you know Verizon tends to lock down their phones way more than anyone else, the LG VX8600 is less locked down than some of your other choices. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Also, Scott can play MP3s out of his phone from a tiny, tiny, tiny little piece of memory. Yeah, that I can. It is quite fun. Yes, I mean tiny physically, not tiny in terms of space. I mean, it's not going to replace my iPod anytime soon, but I can carry around, like, you know, the cool songs I found lately, and I could also make ringtones and stuff, but, you know, and then if someone said, if I'm recommending music to someone, like, oh, have you heard this or that? And if they haven't, I could just play it for them on the phone, and the phone speaker ain't so bad. At least not for, you know, do you like this? So now it'll be all those times when we're somewhere, and then someone says, Mock and I supremacy, I never heard of that. And I could just push a button on the front of my phone, and it starts playing. We're ready. We're ready to fix those people. Yep. Right, so I guess in the news, get right into this here. Uh, One of the biggest problems with desktop Linux, in terms of being used by anyone other than, I don't know, people like you listening to this show and people like us, is that for various reasons, a lot of things that should just be in Linux and come with a computer, or at least be very easy to install. Well, a lot of these things don't even come with Windows or Mac, like codecs, for playing different video files and such. Oh, yeah, but for people who aren't used to Linux, it's a lot easier to get them for Windows than it is to get them for Linux. I mean, remember... The Windows. Well, it's not easier. No, it's easier. I mean, for... once you, it's it's more obvious how to do it. Well, what I'm saying is, it's easier for them based on their knowledge and yeah, their it's experience. Yeah, because they already know how to do it for Windows. Well, the Windows paradigm is very different. There's definitely the idea of go out, get software, download an executable, run it to install, install it somewhere. Yep. And the that idea does, that of, does not exist on the uh, on the Linux. The idea of a repository where all your software is just in it and you just say, install this, install this, and it automatically happens is utterly alien and strange. I mean, back in IT, at our IT, when I was taking, you know, like sysadmin1 and all those early crap classes about Linux and Unix and servers and whatever, whenever we were doing a Linux lab, most people in getting going into IT didn't really know much about Linux or never used it before. So one of the most common questions in these classes was, so I just installed Apache. Apache. Uh, where is it installed? Where's the Apache directory? <laughs> Where's the icon for Apache? <laughs> What's going on? I'm scared and confused and lost. Lol. So I was I'm, like that back in 1999. Oh, 98. <laughs> no, 99. In 98, I don't think I had a computer that could run Linux. In 99, I knew what Linux was, but I'd never used it. Uh, it wasn't until I got to RIT that I installed Mandrake and I started using yeah. Red Hat 7.3. Yeah, I used Linux in 99, but I didn't really use it until like 2000, 2001. But anyway, this is a big problem, that especially even the best, most easy-to-use distro out there for desktop Linux, Ubuntu, 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 <laughs> has this problem. You, know, you get it, and it comes with a bunch of stuff, and it just works. Unless you want to use Flash or Java. Or you want the real Acrobat Reader or, well, the Java, I think they solved that problem because Sun changed their license. Yeah, but that is a recent development. That is a recent development. Or uh, video codecs. Audio codecs. Your NVIDIA driver. Yeah, all that stuff. And the reason you don't get that stuff is for legal reasons. Well, two levels. of There's legal reasons and ideological reasons. Mm-hmm. And... Half of it is legal reasons that the people who make these things, just their licenses are either broken or restrictive or whatever. For example, their license will say something like, you may not distribute this software. So if you want to get this software, even though it might be free, you have to get it from them. 
or there might be some end user license agreement you have to agree to that's on their website. So it would be illegal for me to agree to the agreement and then give you the software because you didn't agree to the agreement on the website. Or uh, this happens a lot too, ideological reasons in that the people who maintain Linux distros or Linux in general or BSD or what have you tend to look down upon software that is not as free, if not freer than whatever they're making. Yeah, so they make all they make all this Linux and all this software that runs on Linux open source. And the NVIDIA driver is not open source at all. You, you have no idea what's in there. So they just refuse to have non-open source stuff in their deal. Even though there's no legal reason they couldn't have it in there or make it easy to be installed or make a button that installs it when you get it. They just... They want to pressure the industry and other people who write software for companies into conforming to their free software ideal. And while I very much support the free software ideal, I think part of that is that you don't force people who don't want to go along with it to open everything they ever do up for free. Yeah, I mean, exa if I have a choice, I mean, I would prefer if there was open source stuff. You know, the, the NVIDIA network card driver used to be closed. There, used, there is still a closed source one, but they came out with an open source one that, was, that actually worked. So I switched. Yeah, well, like, nothing I would do for technology, I would ever attempt to patent or enforce copyright or anything on it. I would pretty much GPL just about anything I ever did. Yeah, I mean, if I could use everything in the whole world open source, that would be the best thing in the world. I would be very happy. Grow but up, Well, notwithstanding the patent IBM has in my, or is trying to get in my name. Right. Like no control over. But anyway, I want my video card to work. I am willing to sacrifice the fact that I can't... It's I, My choices are, at the present time... You know, this is the reality of the world. Either use a closed source video card driver to get my video card to work properly, or use an open source driver that works kind of shittily. Now, here's the S9 is not of this satisfactory. Whole, here's the all. S9 is of this whole situation. It's still free. It's just free as in beer and not free as in speech. So even though it's perfectly free, a lot of zealots still refuse to allow these things to be easily used or automatically used. Because it's not as free as they'd like it to be, even though it's still free. Yeah, there are crazy people out there. You know, it's one thing. You don't want to buy an NVIDIA video card because they don't have an open source driver. That's all. That's good by you. You can go buy a video card that is, you know, supported by open source software in the kernel. And hooray for you. Yeah, good luck doing anything 3D. <laughs> if you look at the users of Ubuntu... Ubuntu. Most of them have NVIDIA or ATI cards, and most of them want the drivers. You know, back when, before Ubuntu had the proper Firefox Ubuntu. icon, there was a huge thread of people wanting the real icon. Most of the users are not zealots. It's just most of the developers are the crazy zealots. Well, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, is making great strides toward overcoming this, and there is now a package only available to people using Feisty Fawn. So if you're... A little bit ahead of the curve. Yeah, Dapper wanna... Drake is the current super safe one. Edgy Eft is like the you're a badass one. And Feisty Fawn is the you're crazy. Yeah, I would recommend using Edgy for now. If, it, if Edgy works, use Edgy. If not, use Dapper. Yep. Cause... Don't use Feisty Fawn until it's ready. It's unless, not ready right well, now. Well, unless you it's not your primary computer or you just really want to ex be experimental and have some fun and possibly have some problems. Yeah, don't, don't use Feisty Fawn on your main important computer that has to work but for feisty fawn there's a new official meta package called ubuntu dash restricted dash extras and it automatically installs a bunch of codecs flash java and the microsoft fonts Ooh, microsoft fonts that's the one i forgot about yeah i don't know if it does all of them but i imagine well, it, it does probably it. does the msttf core fonts it probably does the ones that can technically be gained for free yeah it's like the ariel the tahoma the verdana the all that's set the yeah. helvetica whatever is in there i don't remember so uh, props to the Ubuntu team or whoever put this forth or whoever is pushing for this inside of Ubuntu to make open source and Linux more accessible to normal people as opposed to just people like us. Yeah. I, now, the, now when people ask, you know, how do I get all these things to work in my Ubuntu? I can tell Ubuntu. them one single command to type in, app get install something restricted whatevers. <laughs> what did you say it was called? Uh Ubuntu dash restricted dash extras. App, uh, so it also automatically, while it's installing, enables the multiverse and universe repositories. So you don't even it, it solves all these problems. So it'll open up this whole world to people who don't know much about computers but happen to be using Ubuntu, but don't know that there's a multiverse and a universe. Yep, it'll it'll fix everything basically. You won't need to use. Uh, either Easy Ubuntu Easy Ubuntu or Automatics anymore. Those are basically useless because of this, which yes. is good. 
Yes. Because those things were not the greatest. They were hacks at best. Yeah. And not that they weren't awesome. <laughs> well, automatic. Uh, oh, easy Ubuntu was okay. Automatics, not so much. Yeah, automatics caused some problems for me. <laughs> yeah, it caused some problems for a lot of people. Yeah. All right. My news is just sort of this general news. This general news is that, well, let's see. We're putting this out Monday night. Most people listen on Tuesday. Tuesday is another Steve Jobs day. Oh, oh boy. Oh, shit. Also. The Consumer Electronics Show, perhaps the biggest trade show of electronics, everything, computers, everything. Well, consumer electronics. Right. And is happening now in Las Vegas, and tomorrow the show floor opens up. So we got Steve Jobs at Macworld, and we got CES at the same time. So half of the tech reporters in the world are at Macworld, and the other half are at CES. And this week, you're going to see some crazy, crazy tech news some Apple goodies, some everything. There have been a lot of rumors as to what Apple's going to be announcing, ranging from, God, I'm Ranging from, uh, like, I don't know, freaking Mac phones that work with any carrier to, like, tablets and God knows what crazy shit people come up with. Yeah, we're not even going to get into that because, there, yeah. I mean, the rumors about Apple stuff are to the point where they're just insane. And most of them are not true ever. And it's just this crazy thing that you really shouldn't care about. Yeah, I never really understood the people who, like, pay attention to the rumors of what's going to go down. Because, number one, sure, sometimes it's right, but, but, but you don't know if it's right or wrong before it happens. So what? So knowing a day earlier doesn't do anything for you. You know, it's... it. it yeah, and it's I, not like this uh, is speculation. It's not like people are saying, like, I think Apple's going to do this. Like, when the Nintendo with the Wii... There was a lot of speculation as to what they were going to name it. There was a lot of speculation as to what was going to happen. But the Apple people, they don't seem to speculate so much. It's just make shit up <laughs> and then believe it. Like, I, I imagine a feedback loop where one guy just kind of says that they're going to make a phone. And then it goes through ten friends. And then one of his friends, like, in another state calls him and says, I heard Apple's making the phone. And he thinks to himself, I knew it. And people are so crazy to, like, find out this piece of information. Like... I heard people saying stuff like, um, yeah, they have to print up all these banners before Macworld, and then after the keynote, they take covers off all the banners. So if we go to the printer, we'll be able to see what they're printing on those banners, and we'll know what they're going to release. <laughs> and I'm like, D you're not going to be able to get this freaking product any sooner. I mean, even if you knew what they were going to show you tomorrow, two days ago, that's not going to bring the release date forward. You're not suddenly going to get it for cheaper, or you're not going like, to get two of them. Why don't you're, we just sell, like, Steve Jobs' fingernail clippings on eBay? I don't know, because it's hard to talk to the guy. I mean, no one talks to him. They don't need to be real. <laughs> 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 yeah, but, you know, look, this, uh, this week, if you're interested in buying a new phone or a computer... Or anything. There's all sorts of new things coming out that are going to be real interesting. And you should definitely wait until next week before making any technology purchasing decisions. Yes. Now, no one from the Geek Night staff is obviously going to be flying out there to... To Las Vegas or California. Yes. However, if any of our loyal listeners in the area want to in any way report on this for us, I can practically guarantee we'll read or play whatever you send us. Yeah. But uh, most likely we'll just go to Engadget.com and read whatever they write. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they, they got everything covered there. It'd be nice to have some first-hand uh, reporting. They, it is first-hand at Engadget. Well, first-hand exclusive from us. I mean, Engadget's it's, not It's kind of hard to be exclusive when Engadget covers everything. No, no, no. The news itself wouldn't be exclusive, but the guy talking would be exclusive to us. Uh, and Gadget's not going to pick up on our listener talking about the thing he saw at the... Great Unless show. Engadget listens to Geek Nights, which I doubt. I don't know. You'd be I mean, Katsukan listened to Geek Nights, and we didn't realize that till after I got back from a Katsukan. Uh, I'm pretty sure Engadget doesn't listen to Geek Nights because they don't respond to my emails. <laughs> I don't think they respond to any emails. No, they do. Sometimes on their podcast. Things of the day. Aw, shit. So many of you might remember, especially if you're in our general age group, that back in the early 90s, there was a show called Tiny Toons that many of us watched. Well, you know, Tiny Toons, actually, when it first came out, like I saw, like, you know, ads for it. Like, watch Tiny Toons. And I was like, whatever. I'm not watching that crap. 
And then I guess eventually one day I watched it by accident and then I kept watching it. See, I knew it was good. I watched it for a long time, pretty much from the moment it started. I like that show a lot. To this day, I could still watch it and enjoy it. Yeah, what was the best part of Tiny Toons for you? Well, I think the best part of Tiny Toons for me was the same best part for many people in the demographic listening to this show. You see, there was one episode where they did a bunch of music videos. No, that's not the best part. The best part is Wacky Land with the Dodo Bird. Okay. That's right. Anyone who disagrees with me is wrong. So anyway, uh, for everyone who disagrees with Scott, there was an episode of way back where they did a bunch of music videos, and two of these music videos were to two... I'm pretty sure there are actually two different music video episodes. There were, That's in right. fact. Uh-huh. But two of the music videos that are most remembered were both to They Might Be Giant songs. Particle Man and my thing of the day here, the complete music video to Istanbul, not Constantinople. Istanbul. Constantinople, now it's Istanbul, now Constantinople, been a long time gone, Constantinople, now it turns to light on a moonlit night. Now, I just rem- think, I remember going through RIT, and every now and then, this song would come up, and without fail, most people around us would bring up that episode of Tiny Toons, or if They Might Be Giants ever came up, that song would come up, followed by a mention of that episode of Tiny Toons. It was weird, because I before I had seen the episode, I somehow knew the song, Right? Well, the song is old as hell. Istanbul was Constantinople, now it's Istanbul. Not Constantinople. I know, it's like I, I knew the song, like, you know, Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And then I saw the episode, and I was like, ah, there's that song. Now I had like a grasp on what they were saying in the song. But I didn't know they might be giants or anything for a I while. I thought they were saying instead of Turks, I thought it was jerks. Nah, I did too. <laughs> But I, I didn't realize at first when I saw this that They Might Be Giants was a real band, and I thought it was this, this joke song for the show. And it percolated in my mind, because Particle Man and Istanbul just kind of, they were catchy, weird songs that weren't really like the music I listened to at the time. I won't go into the music I listened to at the time. Mostly Michael Jackson and hair metal. Criss Cross? I li- I, not only did I listen to Criss Cross, but I went to a Criss Cross concert. Oh, shit. It was Okay. B- boys to men uh, <laughs> yeah 90s oh the 90s which were infinitely better than the 80s which were infinitely worse than the 70s <laughs> indeed right so this is just that complete music video and i hope that many of you share the deep sense of nostalgia that i have and also uh i'll just note that it was because of this that i discovered they might be giants and became a fan from that day uh, since yeah, I didn't actually realize, I didn't pay attention actually who sung songs when I was that age, so I didn't know they might be giants for quite a while oh, afterwards. I didn't either until I was talking to people at school one day, and I was like, hey, Tiny Toons, that song, and one kid was like, yeah, it's this band called They Might Be Giants, and I checked them out, and uh-huh. I didn't buy a CD or anything, because I didn't buy, that was even before MP3s, I just thought CDs were a ripoff even back then. Man, remember when CDs, they didn't come in jewel cases. They came in these big freaking things with all sorts of stuff on them. Yeah. And all sorts of extra crap inside you didn't want. Little lyrics books and posters. I no, just... no, no. Like, like just plastic to protect it. Like, they were covered in crap. Yeah. Like, when DVDs first came out, they were just covered in stuff. Remember when t- cassette tapes had a big plastic thing on it, so they were hard to steal? No, I remember when I got a, a, a Michael Jackson CD... And it had the crappiest, tiniest, folded up, pre-ruined poster of Michael Jackson I've ever seen. <laughs> Just folded up and kind of shoved into this giant plastic monstrosity that held the CD. Oh, man. Those old oh. days. Yep. Yeah. Before Napster. Yeah, and then Tiny Toons went away and we had Animaniacs, which is just as good but different. Yep. And now there's nothing. Nothing like that anymore. I mean, I guess now we just watch anime. Yeah, it's like we had the actual Looney Tunes, then we had the Tiny Tunes, then the Animaniacs, and now nothing. So my thing today is just a funny YouTube video because I'm lazy and it made me laugh. Uh, yeah, it's hilarious. What can I say? Yeah. You got this guy. He's obviously some sort of medical doctor student or something. Maybe he's training to be a forensic guy or whatever. And he's practicing an autopsy, and he explains the autopsy he's going to practice. Something to do with removing arteries or veins, or I don't even know, because he talks in doctor talk. And so you're, you're like, you know those dogs, like, blah, 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 mittens, blah, blah. I guess we heard, blah, 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 veins, blah, blah, blah. That's pretty much what it was, yeah. And he's, de- he's sitting next to this dead body on a table. The body's dead. And uh, he's looking at this camera, and he's describing as calmly as any doctor would, you know, what he's about to do. 
And then he's about to get to work. And the hand of the dead body goes up and goes down again. And the guy reacts in a, a classic and genuine way. And I won't tell you, uh, you know, the secret to that. You can watch the video. Yeah. And that'll be the funny part. <laughs> <laughs> All I have to say is that guy implemented one of the proper protocols for dealing with a possible zombie attack. Ah, it is true. He Protocol didn't... number one. If a dead body moves, get the fuck out and figure out what happened later. See, I don't know why. Here's the thing that they messed up, though, right? While he had the proper reaction to the zombie attack, the possible zombie attack, he did not have the uh, necessary, how do you say, preparedness for a zombie attack. Well, yes, I mean... If you're in a morgue or any sort of <laughs> corpse storage facility... There should be shotguns and glass things on the wall. At least a Louisville slugger. At least. Crowbars worked it. Because for all we know, he was on his way to get it. He could have been. He could have been. I love how when the prank is over, the perpetrators of the prank say something to the effect of, where'd he go? <laughs> all right. Right. So today, we're, this is kind of a geek back, but it turns into a whole episode. And we're not going to read the questions that spawned this because we have had, I think, three or four people ask us, Things along these lines. So we're going to cover yeah. them all at once. Yeah, a lot of our listeners are in the late high school age category. And a lot of people aren't, but this might be interesting to you anyway. And they often ask us, because I was a CS major and now I am a BS and CS. And I was an IT major and I'm now a BS in IT. And they say, I'm going to college and I like computers, but there are so many computer majors. Which one do I do? So we said, hey. Let's do this really easy show that doesn't take a lot of effort, and we'll tell people what all the different computer technology majors are. Now, first so you off, you can choose the right one. If you don't know any of this, and you really have no idea what we're talking about, and you're going to learn a lot from it, don't be ashamed at all. Because when I went to RIT before I was a student, I didn't even know there were majors other than computer science. Yeah, I mean, here's a big, the biggest, uh, the problem here is that. When people are getting ready to go to college, if they decide to go to college, which is a debate for another time whether you should go to college or not, we can leave that. We'll just assume you're decided to go already because that's for another show entirely, a Thursday show. <laughs> um, one of the people you go to that knows shit is your guidance counselor in high school. Well, well, knows shit, I guess, should have some uh, quotes around it. I know. I meant it quite literally. <laughs> And that guidance counselor is someone that is often trusted to know about these things because, well, that's their job. Now, to paraphrase many famous uh, comedic quotes, why are you taking career advice from someone who ended up being a guidance counselor in your local high school? Exactly. Anyway, guidance counselors, most of them don't know that much about technology because if they did, they wouldn't be guidance counselors. So when you say, hey, I like computers, what major should I pick? They have no freaking clue 90% of the time. They'll probably say computer science, MIT. I'm pretty sure there are, you know, there are guidance counselors out there who must know. There must be good guidance counselors. But in my experience, I've never met any. My guidance counselor in middle okay. school told, Drugs are bad. <laughs> my guidance counselor in middle school told me to slack off in school because my extra brains weren't going to get me anywhere and I shouldn't worry about it. Right. Anyway, the pr most guidance counselors end up telling you, just take computer science because that's all they know. And a lot of people end up going in and applying to schools for computer science. Well, that's not what they want to do. Not they don't only, want to do computer science at all. Not only do you not want to do the computer science, possibly, but if you haven't already done some prep work, some of the computer majors are pretty much already out of the question. Mm -hmm. Like, if you go into a school, at least a good tech school, and you want to be a computer science major or an IT major or computer engineering major, and you don't already know some things... You're pretty much fucked. And there's Unless really... you're really smart. Yes, but it's been my experience that most people are not. Yeah, for example, RIT, where we went, tells you, and they don't lie technically, that you could become a computer science major at RIT if you have never seen a computer before in your entire life and you don't even need to own a computer in order to be a computer science major at RIT and pass. <laughs> it's true. You could possibly pass and get a bachelor's degree in computer science at RIT, never having seen a computer before in your life, and not owning a computer ever, even while you're at RIT, and only using the computers in the lab. Dot, dot, dot. If you are the rain man when it comes to computers and technology. If you put in incredible amounts of effort and are very, very smart, 
then yes. Otherwise, no. And even then, it'll suck. To reasonably pass and get a degree in computer science from any legitimate tech school or legitimate secondary education provider in the whole country, in the whole world, you need to have programmed a computer before you get there or else you're going to be very, very lost. Now, this seems to be part of a growing problem, and I guess it part of it is that there, we were kind of at the end of the golden age of being forced to learn about computers in order to use them. Now, I'm not saying that computers should be hard to use. Don't get me wrong. The fact that we have GUIs now and that Windows, j- most part, just works and that there's desktop Linux is great. I am not saying we should go back to the old shit days when ICQ would crash and I didn't know why. <laughs> but... We grew up at the end of the era where to make anything work on any computer, other than Macs, and even Macs had their own quirks, you had to do a lot, and you had to learn a lot. And most of what I knew about computers going into school, I had learned from the fact that software just didn't work, period. And you had to do a lot to make it work. Buy a sound card? You had to learn about IRQs and DMAs and slots in the computer. Buy RAM? You had to learn all about BIOSes. Buy a hard drive? You're fucked. Yeah, you know, before us, people had to know even more. When you had a Commodore 64, you had to know a lot about computers if you wanted to, I don't know, make your modem work and get on a BBS. So just by the virtue of people being computer users and using computers when they were very primitive, relatively primitive, uh, they had to know a lot about computers. So if they ended up liking technology and going to college, they're prepared. Nowadays, if you're a MySpace IM kid... You know, browses the web and looks at YouTube videos. Yep, you know how to make word art in Microsoft Word. And, and maybe you can Photoshop some cool pics on your Deviant Arts. Uh, you are not prepared at all for any sort of computer major. So before we begin, my only advice is, uh, in the very least, take some sort of Linux CD, put it in a computer, and try to futz with it. Yeah, Break try, your computer and fix it. Try things. If you want to go to college for computers, learn as much as you can about computers before going there. Maybe go take classes at community college if there's a smart guy there. Some community colleges have smart programming classes. If, you're, if your high school has any sort of computer class, take all of them. I did, even though I ended up teaching the class once or twice. Yep, yep. I mean, I, even, the, high, the computer science class in my high school were VB. <laughs> What more can I say? I didn't even have that. Yeah, it was pretty sad. Now, we're not saying that if you don't have all this extensive knowledge, you can't go into these majors. Just be warned that a lot of times, and our friends accuse us of this a lot, who weren't tech majors, that we really trivialize our education at RIT, and we always kind of joke about how easy it was. And consider this. We basically spent a decade, give or take, learning about computers before we even went to college. I, first time I ever used a computer, kindergarten. And that day, I wrote a program in Logo. I remember in elementary school when I typed an essay in some terrible typesetting program. And I was so proud of that thing. I didn't actually use any word processing until fifth grade. But I, at that time, I also had a CD-ROM encyclopedia. Oh. Fair. But yeah, we, we spent a long time learning about computers before we went to school. So as a result, going to RIT, despite it being an extremely difficult school, I mean... The failure rate is over 50%. Mm-hmm. We, it was easy. Well, it, wasn't spent... fa- it also includes dropouts, not just failures. Yeah. However, most dropouts were due to failing. Most, Or yeah. losing scholarships by having low GPAs. Or just quitting and going somewhere else because yeah. you didn't like R18. Yeah, mostly because it was very hard and you weren't doing very well. <laughs> yeah. All right. So <laughs> At least in the tech part. The first major is the one I did, which is computer science. What is computer science? It is very specifically the science of computing. See, the hit little history here, and then we'll list all the majors and go into all of them in detail. Computer science originally was the only computer major, really. And mm-hmm. they lumped everything involving computers into computer science. The reason there's confusion now is that guidance counselors are old and things change quick. It wasn't that long ago that the first IT program was formed at RIT. I mean, think about it. decades ago... Biology was the major. Now there's molecular biology, bioinformatics, organic whatnots, and all kinds of biology majors. Genetic thingies, and I don't even know because I don't know enough about biology. Yep. So computer science eventually split off information technology. Mm -hmm. Now IT became kind of the catch-all. Computer engineering split off from, uh, basically from CS and not from IT. 
and then software engineering split off from CS, and then networking split off from IT. And there's like electronic engineering and micro electronic engineering and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, but it used to all just be CS, so that's where most of the confusion comes from. Yep. Anyway, computer science, if you take computer science today as your major, you are going to be writing software. Who knows what kind of software you're going to write? You might be writing desktop applications like Microsoft Word. You might be writing web applications like Dig. You might be writing drivers for NVIDIA video cards. You might work on the Linux kernel. You might be writing new computer languages. But whatever it is, you're going to be writing code, whether it's PHP, C Sharp, or Assembler, or something. Computer science is writing code of some sort. There's a lot of things in the world that need r code written for them. Not just computers. You could write code for cell phones. Toasters. Toasters, microwaves. Uh, co there is computer code on basically anything uh, with an integrated circuit. You could be writing code for games. You could be writing code for the cash register at the pizza place. Computer science people write code. So if you don't like writing code... Stay the hell away from computer science. You will not be happy. Yes, and depending on which kind of computer science you do, you know, where you take it, you might be doing some pretty hard maths or some other sort of stuff. Like if you want to write languages, you have to learn all about grammars and language theory and there's some complex discrete maths going on in there. And if you want to do computer graphics, there's some calculus is going on in there. If you want to write physics engines, also some calculus is going on. Yeah, in there. you need to know you need you need to know a lot about logic and logical processes, a lot about math. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot of theory, a lot of things like efficient sorting algorithms and object-oriented programming versus uh, linear programming. Yeah, most nowadays object-oriented programming is is pretty much the standard you know design methodology behind all the languages. So the first thing you're going to learn in computer science classes is object-oriented principles and, and such, and design patterns and crap like that. So if you are thinking about being computer science, you like writing code, you should probably know the basics of object-oriented programming before going in. Or in the very least, know something about programming. Yeah, if you know basic, you'll probably be all right, actually. Yeah, because if you can program that way, then... When they tell you about object-oriented programming, you won't go, what the hell is this? You'll go, wow, that makes it a lot easier. Yeah, they spent like one day in about, let's see, in CS1 at RIT, after about two class periods, which is two hours, they had already covered everything that was in the basic programming language, which I already knew. But for other people, if you had never programmed before, you'd just be like, WTF, mate. <laughs> and they, they basically, one of the required books for the... Uh, First seat for CS1 was this Unix book that wasn't so great. But if you didn't already know how to use Unix, Linux, Solaris, or any other kind of Nix operating system, and that's what they use there, and any good school is going to use some sort of Unix type operating system for all their programming uh, action, you're going to have trouble. Yep. I mean, it won't be like, oh, you won't be able to do the assignments, but it'll be problems like if you don't know about Linux, you won't know how to. Uh, make a shell into the campus code computer from your dorm so you don't have to go to class. You won't know how to back your stuff up or run tests on the super fast cluster that's sitting over in the computer science department. Yeah, you won't know how to send an email from the command line when, you know, or anything like that. You'll be pretty, uh, you'll be pretty lost. You They'll tell you to, to use CVS and you'll go, what? Yeah, yeah. That's not good. You're going to have to learn a lot of things beyond just coding if you don't already know about Linux. And if you go to a school that's not using Unix or Linux or whatever on its computer science machines, probably not the greatest school. Yes, I mean... I also, mean, sure, they'll probably have a Windows lab and maybe a Mac lab, but they're mostly going to be concentrating on some sort of Nix thing if they're a good school. I think we'll split off into a separate show, talk about like what makes a good CSIT whatever program versus a bad one and which schools to go to. All right, that sounds cool. Because I could do a whole separate thing about that. Yep. But yeah, CS, very briefly, I don't know, RIT, MIT, Caltech, Carnegie Mellon, Rose Hallman. Uh, yeah. Places like that. Georgia Tech. All right, now, somewhat related... Places with the word tech. Yes. Yeah. Related to uh, CS very much, so we'll do that next, is something called software engineering. Mm. Software engineering. Now, you got to understand that in the world where people are doing work programming, they work mostly in teams on big projects. And when you have a big project and a team, 
You know, everyone does a small part of a big program. You know, when you write a program by yourself, you map, you design it, and then you write all the parts, and then you make them work together. And it's always, it's usually something very small or trivial. Mm -hmm. When you have so such a big project that so many, that like 30 people need to work on it together, then you need someone, you know, who can plan all this out and say, all right, you do this part, you do this part, you do this part. This is how these parts are going to work together. These are how these parts are going to work together. You know, they got to see the big picture. You know, they got to know how to code, but mostly they got to look at the big picture and figure out how these things are going to fit and work together so that all these other people can work separately and then all their work can be combined into one thing. And it's got to be done efficiently. You know, you don't want to have people wasting time coding. You know, and all this sorts of like, process sort of stuff. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot more uh, abstract theory. Not as much of the math, but a lot more things like process theory, software design cycle stuff, yeah, you read workflow that, management. Yeah, there's that famous book, The Mythical Man Month. That's all about software engineering. That's what that is. To make a nice analogy, computer science... Say that we're talking about a symphony orchestra. Computer science are the people who play the instruments or write the music. Sometimes they'll be playing Or the sometimes they figure out, they study music theory, and they learn about music itself. Yes, but they're mostly writing the music and possibly playing the music. The software engineer is like the conductor. Mm -hmm. He is the one who is directing everyone. You do this part, you do this part. You're going too slow, you better speed up. You're going too fast, you better slow down. He's also the guy who, you know, who will take the music theory that computer science has just figured out and then apply it to design a large project and then distribute all the pieces of the design to little worker monkeys who will make those parts. And then, I think to simplify the analogy, we'll just we'll consider just a performance. Yep. So computer science playing the instruments, software engineering conducting. Yep. Now we'll get into my major, because it follows right along. Information technology, which is a relatively recent major. And it's relatively broad. Yes, you see it started at RIT actually and it is basically the catch-all for all the cracks of computing. Uh, IT jobs range from system administrator to network administrator, network architect, database admin, um, help desk, tech support, computer repair, consulting, project management, management. IT is pretty much everything that isn't covered by another computer major. Yeah, every other computer major is usually involved in making computers or making computers do stuff. Information technology, those are the people who know a lot about computers so that they can use them. They use all the stuff that everyone else makes, in, you know, but they're not users Yes, in I, a way. And, and IT is very broad, and most other majors like CS or uh, software engineering, you might have concentrations and you'll specialize in things like... In computer science, some people specialize in, like, artificial intelligence, but they still learn all the fundamentals. The IT fundamentals are very, very broad, and then you specialize in a number of areas. Like, for example, I specialized in network administration, system administration, things like that. You could specialize in database administration. Security. Yep. They're, they're so I couldn't even list all of them, but you basically pick a bunch of directions you want to go, specialize in those... So you get depth in a few areas and breadth on every other topic in computing. Mm -hmm. Now, the biggest myth about IT is that you don't write code. And that fucks a lot of people. A lot of people find out that, you know, computer science, you got no calculus. It's hard. You got to code. They go into IT. And then one of their first classes is Java. And they got to write a whole bunch of code and learn it. I mean... It's I, not like... It's not really no, writing no, code. No, no, no. It's basically like if you already knew BASIC and then you were going into CS... You had already met the requirements of code writing in IT. The problem is when you have these people who have never written code in their lives, so they go into IT thinking it's just all the stuff they've used to installing software and partitioning drives and building computers. Yeah, those are so basic. They're and then covered. they have to learn basic, and they're like, oh, shit. Yep. I mean, IT, you'll learn a little bit of everything. You won't be a coder. You won't be writing code for your job. But you'll learn enough code to look at code and understand what it does, and you'll know at least... I need code that does X, and then you would know how to ask a CS major to make that code. Yeah, or if, like, you're an administrator, you'll be able to write yourself a little script to help you do fancy stuff instead of yeah. needing a programmer to make it for you. Like, and one thing you will do a lot of is scripting, which technically it's, it's coding, but it's definitely in a different scale. Scripting is like, I have a computer. I need to periodically back up all these files. I write a little Python script that automatically does that for me, categorizes them all, and does whatever. 
Mm-hmm. You write useful short utilities that are often replicated all over the internet to make your life easier. Mm-hmm. Now, IT, just, I guess the only real thing I want to warn people about is that IT is not easier than CS, as the, like a lot of people think it is. It's just different. And if you go into IT thinking that you'll make the same money as all these other computer people but not learn as much, you're in for a failure. Yeah. Well, if you become a database guy, number one, databases suck. Like, Good guy. Being a database administrator is a terrible job, and it's boring, and it's, it, it's really bad. But you, there is an opportunity to make a lot of money doing that. If you only care about money, go by all means, become a database administrator and learn everything you can about Oracle and Postgres and all that jazz. And you will become a very wealthy person, most likely. Yep. In fact, RIT tried to convince me to go into databases. And I took the intro to databases class, promptly said, fuck this, and never took another database class. Yeah, databases from the perspective of a programmer just writing some PHP SQLs is kind of okay. From the perspective of a guy who has to manage a giant cluster of Oracle machines and optimize the database and keep it running and make sure it doesn't fuck up, and that is a bad job. So in the performing symphony orchestra analogy, the IT people are the ones who sell the tickets at the counter, manage the crowd, announce the band, clean the instruments, arrange the chairs, and give the conductor his uh, little wand. (laughs) They pretty much do all the stuff that isn't covered by other people's jobs. I think you're taking the analogy a little too far. I'm going to keep going with analogy. I got more. I got more. All right. Well, who do we have next? Well, computer engineering. All right. So... It's pretty simple, computer engineering. You know those video cards you buy? Those NVIDIA video cards? Well, compute, there's the NVIDIA chip on there. Computer engineers don't make that. They just buy that from NVIDIA. There's the NVIDIA driver. Nope, computer scientists make that. Well, what did the computer engineers do? They take the board. They put the chip on it. They design where all the stuff goes on the board. They put all the other stuff that's on there, the little connectors and stuff. And then they put the firmwares on there. That's what a computer engineer does. You take hardware bits and you put them together to make hardware things. You know, you need someone to make uh, a motherboard. Computer engineer can make you a motherboard. That's what they do. Yep. In the symphony orchestra, the computer engineers make the trumpets and the clarinets and all the instruments and give them to the IT guys. Yeah. It's not easy. No, it, it's not. Good God, do people <laughs> fail out of that major like rats off is, of a burning, sinking ship. It is incredibly hard because you need to know about writing low-level assembly-type firmwares. You need to know about electronics and things like that. And it, it, it's pretty complex because you're sort of bridging the hardware and the software worlds. You're not a computer scientist who's all about software, but you're not an electronic engineer who's all about hardware. I was just about to say that computer engineering is the major between computer science and electrical engineering. You bridge the gap between hardware and software, and that is a difficult task, which will get you a lot of monies. Yes, if you graduate... It It is fun, though. It is not as painful as database work. It is just requiring much more knowledge. And also, you'd be surprised the amount of physical dealing with electronic bits at some points that it it also entails. Yeah, like if you're a computer engineer, you won't work for, say, NVIDIA, making NVIDIA chips, but you'll work for one of those video card companies like Gigabyte or MSI, you know, buying NVIDIA chips, making video cards or sound cards or, you know, any other crap like that. Now, another closely related major that most schools don't have because it's very specialized and you need a lot of capital to even set up the basic requirements of teaching. This is microelectronic engineering. All right, microelectronic engineering is not the same as electronic engineering. Microelectronic engineering is very easy to explain. It's the guys at IBM or NVIDIA or Intel or AMD in the white bunny suits. AMD slash ATI, yes. Those guys in the bunny suits that you see in those... It, Intel commercials. You know, the white spacesuits in the white rooms with the white and the yellow. Yes. And they're, they're poking you, at giant machines. Microelectronic engineers design and make computer chips. That is what they do. It is fucking hard. Holy shit. However, I, dep- I mean, I know people who did a lot of that because I worked at IBM. Where- well, if you end up being like, you know, the lead designy guy, it is hard and pays well. The thing is, a lot of people who go into micro E, they end up with a job like just moving platters from one machine to another a few times a day. And it, it's a sweet gig. Well, part of it's that there aren't many schools that offer that sort of program. No, let, they're not. Let because alone you, you schools, need very advanced equipment. Let alone schools that have a good program. I mean, RIT actually had... The clean rooms with the people in white suits, and they made RAM and all sorts of things as part of their day, you know, normal classwork. Mm-hmm. 
it's probably a really fun major. Be warned that there's a lot more engineering and a lot more practical concerns and a lot less theory and a lot less computers. There is there's almost no computers. It's all, you know, low level electronics and transistors and designing where the transistors go on this little piece of silicon and then the process of producing that piece of silicon and there's some material science going on in there and it's it's science. It is engineering and science, and it is it is not really computers, even you're, though you are making things that go in computers. You're also generally very restricted in the places you will work because very few places in the world require such people. Mm -hmm. So you'll pretty much have to live near a major city or a major microelectronic manufacturing center unless you rise up the chain enough to be some sort of designer, mm -hmm. which actually they're outsourcing a lot of that overseas yeah. now. Yeah, if you go into this major, you're going to be spending a lot of time working in college because it, it just takes time to do this stuff. You're going to be having to learn a whole lot of very difficult things and it, your, your jobs are going to be pretty narrow. So you're going to have a lot of competition to get the best jobs when you get out. However, even though there are not many people to compete with. However, you'll probably make good money. And it did look like a lot of fun. Though I will warn you that those suits are not comfortable. No. Good God, do you not want to be in one of those suits? Though I imagine the higher up people who are doing the real work or the design work or the highly paid people get better suits. But I didn't get a very nice suit at IBM at all. Yeah. I do. I have heard stories of microelectronic engineers. They end up working somewhere, and all they have to do is some move some wafers from one machine to another. You know, because that's how it ended up. And they work like a few hours a day here and there. They get paid giant piles of money, and they spend the rest of the day smoking weed and hanging out. But that's just uh, hearsay I've heard. Now, it, could, it could be true, but it might not be. There are a whole bunch of other related majors, and there are also majors that are unique to a school or are brand new and haven't expanded past the school yet. I guess we can touch on a bunch of them briefly. Like RIT recently split off applied networking from IT. Mm -hmm. So in fact, I, I met all the requirements for it. So I could have graduated with an IT degree, which is very broad based or a networking degree, which is much more narrow and focused. And I chose IT because no one's heard of applied networking and it's brand new. And I'd rather have all the clout of having a broad IT bachelor of science. Mm -hmm. Also, RIT, it's just what it says. It's networking. Yep. Also, RIT had two different majors. Both of them were called New Media, but one of them was in the art school, and one of them was in the IT school. Yes, the IT New Media is the only one we would care about or talk about. And it's well, no, the art New Media is pretty simple. You want to be a guy who makes like you know good-looking websites. That that's that's what it is. You're making flashes and good-looking websites. Yeah, but the New Media in IT was basically. Interactive digital design and, you know, designing websites, designing, you know, front ends for websites, interfaces for things, anything that would involve new web 2.0, web whatever point oh media. The major was kind of new and wasn't terribly well defined when we were there. And I imagine it's still changing. Yeah. And I don't know what kind of job you would get with that, but it seemed like the IT one concentrated more on, you know, since it was a BS, it was like the science of designing you know, good interfaces and, you know, various things involving new types of media, whereas the art one was more about designing things from well from an art perspective, you know, making good-looking websites as opposed to the most user-friendly websites, mathematically speaking. Now, the only other real distinction is between a Bachelor of the Arts, a Bachelor of Science, and an Associate's Degree, and I guess Master's and Doctorates. Yeah. Um, in terms of Bachelor's versus oh, no, We didn't talk about electronic engineering. I don't think we really need to. Right. Electronic engineering is capacitors and oscillators. Yeah, you're making stuff like uh, radios and cell phones and all kinds of electronics. Like you'll make, we got, we're using a compressor for the show right now. You would be designing that. Yeah, if you if you knew about audio electronics. Yes, which is, I mean, they're actually schematics on top of all these things. I'm looking at one right now. Yeah. But I hate to say this. But in general, if you get an associate's degree in any sort of technology field, it's not terribly useful. You're probably better off just getting some certifications. Well, unless you're not aiming high. I mean, an associate's degree can get you a low-level job. You want to be, you know, the, the computer guy at some small business, associate's degree might do it for you. You want to yeah. be a tech support guy, associate's degree might do it for you. Well, the thing is, you could learn most of that on your own without paying for an associate's you degree. You could. Uh, you, you very well could, yes. And 
there used to be the perception that you get an associate's degree, you get in the door, and then you get promoted. And it used to be true, but it seems like now, if you get an associate's degree, you'll be pulling the cables for me. Mm -hmm. as opposed, And you'll never be me watching someone else pull the cables. Because you won't know enough. <laughs> and even if you do, you don't have a Bachelor of Science, so most companies just won't even look at you. It's the yeah. sad truth. And certifications, you know... I don't want to talk too much about them. We'll do a show about those. Yeah, I'm generally against them. I think they're kind of stupid. But certifications are mostly for older people. They're sort of going out of style. It's like if you're a 50-year-old dude and you didn't – there wasn't a BS in, you know, awesome IT when you were going to college, right? Yeah. But you got a computer job back in those days because you knew about computers a long time ago when, you know, you didn't – there weren't computer degrees. But you knew about them and you got a job and you're still in the industry – certifications are a way to stay current. You know, someone looks at your resume, you're a 50-year-old dude, they say, all right, you worked at doing COBOL 30 years ago and you've been maintaining mainframes and whatever. Prove to me that, you know, you still know what all this modern stuff we're using. Yep, in so that you've case, gotten some certifications. The certs prove, one, that you know something. They prove it, at least as far as a cert can prove that. Yep. And two, they give you direction as to what you should be learning to stay in the game. Mm -hmm. But basically... Certs are useful if you don't have a degree or if your company will pay for them. Oh, if your company will pay for them, they're great. Because if you want to... See, anyone who would care about certifications is someone that I would not want to work for personally. However, if you were the type of person who wouldn't mind working for an idiot or at a sort of not the greatest company as long as they paid you, certifications are great because if the person hiring you doesn't know much about technology... You can just put a list of certifications like, yeah, I'm a Cisco certified blah 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 and a Microsoft system certified blah 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 and an A plus whatnot and a something else. And that'll totally impress them and you can get them to hire you. But anyone who that would impress, I would not want to work for. Now, if you have a bachelor's of science or higher, certifications are effectively worthless because the bachelor of science speaks already enough. They'll see the BS. They'll see I got a job and I don't have any certs. Yeah, I mean, really, if you have a bachelor's of science, that's nothing to sneeze at if it's from a good tech school. And you don't need a single certification. You barely even need job experience at this point. I mean, maybe 30 years down the road or something like that. There'll be all sorts of new fancy technologies that I'll know nothing about, you know, or maybe I'll probably will know about them. But I might be trying to get a job and people won't believe that I know about them because I've been working on this old ass PHP Linux stuff from 30 years ago. So I'll, I'll go get some certification to prove that I still know my shit. Now, as for masters and doctorates, one, there are barely, if at all, doctorates in IT. Yeah, there are doctors of computer science, however. Yes, but those will generally land you academic jobs. Yeah, generally. You could get them doing some really advanced stuff, like, you know, designing things at really high-tech places, like... Probably AMD or someone could use you if you're a doctor in computer science. Or Google. Google could definitely use you. Google will... Basically, if you want to work at Google, you should get a master's or a doctorate because they want... It's going to be hard for them to hire you otherwise. Yeah, at least for IT, though. I mean, most IT master's programs aren't really any more rigorous, really, than the bachelor's program. Mm. And you're not going to come out of a master's in IT program knowing much more than you would have known coming out of a bachelor's program. Yeah. Because you get out of the program whatever you put into it. Mm -hmm. So, And also, having a master's in IT, unless you're going into academia or uh, some special job somewhere, if anything, it might make you less employable. Because now you're overqualified. No one's going to hire you to be a racker and stacker for Cisco switches because they know you'll quit the moment you get a better job and they know you're going to demand a higher salary. Mm. Yeah, basically, if you're a master's or a doctorate in any of these majors can be very useful, it, depending on what school you get it from. And yes, such. and CS but, is more useful than IT. De definitely. When it comes to a master's. But you want to look at the jobs that those degrees are going to get you before you get the degree. Yes, or more importantly, too, what the degree is going to cost you. I mean, we had a friend, Alex, who basically took an accelerated program and got his master's with very little additional expense. Mm, it was and a great a, deal. Yeah, something like that is a great deal. If you can get a master's with minimal expenditure, you might as well do it. Mm. 
-hmm. But don't put yourself into a lot of extra debt getting a master's unless you have a job in mind. Yeah, plus remember, there are jobs out there that you can get with your bachelor's where the company will then eventually pay for you to get your master's in night school or something like that. Yeah, or maybe you get sick of computers altogether. Like, actually, I'm looking at, I've got a BS in IT. I'm kind of thinking about quitting my job, going to law school, and being an IT lawyer. Yeah, you could. I mean, once you have a Bachelor of Science in anything, it's not difficult to go back to school, get a semi-unrelated degree in something else. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of combo degrees that will really uh, do lots of fun stuff. Yeah. Now, watch out for a school that tries to give you a Bachelor of the Arts in any technological field. Yes. If, someone try if some school tries to give you a BA in CS, do not go there. Yeah, that... That now, means that their program was not certified. Yes, we're not saying that Bachelors of the Arts are useless. In fact, they're very much useful, but not in technology. Technology degrees are all Bachelors of Science, and they're tricking you and ripping you off if you go to a school that offers a BA in any of these Yeah, fields. a BA in graphic design is good because you'll become a successful graphic designer. A BA in CS means you went to a crap school and anyone who knows anything won't hire you. Because they won't believe that you learned anything worthwhile from some uncertified crap CS program. So I hope that was at least a little bit illuminating as to the possible options. Uh, if anyone has more questions about this, feel free to email us, send us an audio, post in the forums. Yeah. If we get enough questions, we'll do another show on this. Otherwise, we'll just answer you directly. And just one final note. If you like decide what kind of school you want to go to... Make sure you ask that school about the majors they offer because it's not exactly the same at every school. And you could probably get on the phone with, you know, like the chairman of the CS department of some school, if you're, especially if you're a hot prospective student, and they will explain to you what the different majors entail. Yeah, and I mean, a lot of schools just don't offer everything. Like, back in high school, I was offered a full ride to Arizona State, and I kind of considered it. I wanted to go play in the band. It would have been cool. But then I looked, and they had a CS program, but they didn't have an IT program. Yeah. So I was like, sorry, I can't go there. You don't have what I want. Mm -hmm. So make sure to ask the school. That, that'll that always get you the most accurate information. Yep. And, of course, send us feedback. Let us know if you want to hear more about this. I mean, we could go into great detail about our experiences in CS and IT, respectively. Yeah. And we could go into great detail about what are the good schools and what are the not-so-recognized schools when it comes to these majors. Yeah, but you could find that all from, like, the Internet. Yeah, but if you really want us to tell you instead of Google, you can, instead of type in Google and then, you know, the names of schools and the names of degrees, just type uh, Google Geek Nights, click on the audio link. <laughs> and then wait a week or two. <laughs> yeah. And that was Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for our opening theme. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontrowcrew.com. If you like our podcasts, you'll love our forums. Make sure you visit them. You can send your email feedback to geeknights at gmail.com. And if you want, you can leave us a voicemail at 206-333-1537. Geek Nights airs every weeknight, Monday through Thursday. Geek Nights is recorded with absolutely no studio and no audience. But unlike those other talk shows... It's actually recorded at night.